So today we are joined by Ray Morans, who is the Grazing Lands Pollinator Ecologist for the Xerces Society. Thank you so much, Ray, for being here. Thank you, everybody else. And we will go ahead and get started. Uh, Rachel, thank you very much for that, uh, for that polite introduction. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. Uh, about the only thing I love more than talking about gardening and butterflies is, is being outside gardening for butterflies. So uh, uh, without further ado, I'll uh, uh, introduce the Xerces Society a little bit. We, of course, are a nonprofit organization protecting wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. We got founded uh, about 50 years ago, almost 50 years ago, I believe. We are based in Portland, Oregon, and we've got, I think, between 50 and 60 staff. This is a picture of our staff from a couple years ago. Uh, how about me? Well, um, I've been working for the Xerces Society for three and a half years. My role is to conserve pollinators in rangelands, uh, areas with, with cattle and, and horses and bison and stuff uh, in the central United States. Um, as part of that role, I am nested within the U.S. Department of Agriculture, specifically within their Natural Resource Conservation Service. Uh, I'm a partner biologist, so uh, when I'm allowed to go to the office, I go to a federal building. Of course, that federal building, uh, uh, currently I'm not allowed to go due, due to COVID, uh, but most of the time that's where I am. I live and work in Stillwater, Oklahoma, and my wife, two children, and I have a small farm, really small, 10 acres, but it's amazing. The main take-home messages of this presentation today uh, are pretty, pretty, simple, pretty simple ideas. Creating gardens for butterflies is fun, and it is pretty darn easy. Uh, and I'm going to help show you how easy it is. Because if you plant it, if you plant the right things, the butterflies will come, almost regardless of where you are. Very obviously, as I think all of you know, butterflies are insects. So please limit use of insecticides. That's a take home message. Um, and also, Gardens can make a difference. They can make a difference to the well-being of butterfly populations, whether those gardens are rural, suburban, or urban. Uh, a brief little biology lesson about butterfly life cycle, uh, and this will be very brief. Uh, up in the upper left, of course, we start with a butterfly egg. The egg usually gets laid on a leaf of a plant. That plant is, is called the host plant. The egg hatches into a small caterpillar, uh, shown over to the right. That caterpillar um, eats the leaves or the flowers and gets larger and larger, eventually turning to a pupa, which is in the, the left side of the screen, and then the pupa metamorphoses into an adult. So it's a four-stage life cycle, very similar to some other insects. Uh, I think mosquitoes might have that life cycle. Uh, numerous other insects have a similar life cycle. What got me interested in butterflies? I used to be a bird scientist in the making. Well, I remember in Florida almost 30 years ago being in a forest, uh, forest sort of like this one, and, and being amazed by what butterflies can do. Uh, this is a forest on our property, and even though we have 10 acres, we have basically nothing, no food, no host plants for the giant swallowtail butterfly. However, I planted two small trees of this species, each tree about a foot and a half tall. I planted them this spring out in the woods. Here's one of them. I planted them in March. And by May 5th, I found two eggs on them. On the left, you see a swallowtail egg. On the right, you see the tiny little caterpillar that resulted from that. And yet, uh, a few days ago, that caterpillar was huge. It looked like a giant bird dropping, or if you looked at it from the head on, it looked like a snake. Uh, that cat caterpillar is still out there this morning. He's getting bigger and bigger, eating the leaves. So it amazes me, isn't it remarkable, that a female swallowtail can find this tiny little tree in a giant forest. That's because of the evolution of butterflies' abilities to detect their host plants. Um, 
And, and I think that's really amazing. That's really what got me into butterfly research and eventually butterfly conservation. This is what the giant swallowtail looks like, by the way, the largest butterfly in the United States, I believe. So just like the giant swallowtail, I, I didn't mention what those plants were. It was uh, a plant called Hercules Club. Well, maybe I didn't mention it, but I'm too nervous. Um, giant swallowtails only lay their eggs on Hercules Club and other plants that are closely related to Hercules Club. That makes them host plant specialists. Well, the same thing is true for the most famous butterfly in North America, the monarch. And many of you know that monarch caterpillars only feed on milkweeds. The zebra swallowtail, it's got the same kind of thing going on. It's a host plant specialist, a very beautiful butterfly. Uh, I don't think you'll find it in the far north, uh, but it's, um, you'll find it in much of the east and the southeast. Uh, I think probably Texas as well, but I'm not sure. And this is the plant it depends on. The, the, there are about 11 species of pawpaw, and those species of pawpaw are the only food of the caterpillar of the zebra swallowtail. So the implications of host plant specialization for the gardener are very clear. If you plant the host plant, there's a really good chance that butterfly species will occupy your property if, that, if you're within the range of the butterfly and that butterfly uh, likes the general type of habitat you're in. There are some butterflies that are really specialized that I could never hope to get to my property, even if I planted their host plant, but, but not many. Typically, if you plant the host plant, you're gonna get the butterfly. On the other hand, if you and your neighborhood lack the host plants, you are unlikely to see the butterflies that depend on those plants, except during migration. Of course, adult butterflies uh, don't gobble up plants. They often suck nectar. The, there are some other things they feed on, like sweat. Sometimes you'll see butterflies land on people's arms to drink the sweat off on a hot summer day. But usually they feed on nectar. Um, they use a variety of nectar plants, but they also show preferences. So of thousands of species of flowering plants in Oklahoma, the monarch butterfly only vis visits a few of those species frequently. Those plant species, by the way, are not all necessarily closely related. So whereas monarchs only lay their eggs on uh, milkweed plants, the adults can eat, can drink nectar from a variety of families, including at the aster family, the coffee family, etc. So uh, I've told you about two essential things to bring butterflies to your gardens, host plants and nectar plants. But another really important aspect of butterfly gardening and gardening for pollinators in general is protecting your habitat from pesticides. Um, and whether you're in an urban space or a suburban space or a rural space, try to keep uh, pesticides, insecticides in particular, um, out of, your, out of your gardens if you can. Now, I, as a youth, I used a variety of insecticides. My dad taught me to use a variety of chemicals to kill bugs. Um, and I still, upon occasion, used herbicides to get rid of uh, invasive plant species. Uh, but as you could probably guess, even with herbicides, because they're uh, manufactured chemicals, there are potential dangers to their use. So please be very, very cautious and do try to avoid the use of insecticides. Um, there are many, many insecticides at your local store that would be lethal to butterflies or even sub-lethal. Maybe it doesn't kill the butterfly, but it, it, it messes with their behavior. And I don't have a, a slide to, 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 to show this, but please note many of the plants that you purchase at the local nursery have insecticides in them. They've been treated with insecticides. Uh, University of Florida has conducted a, a, a delightful study on this. Fascinating, it's not happy news. Uh, many of the milkweed plants uh, that they studied were loaded with toxins. The Xerces Society is conducting a similar uh, study and we are finding the same thing. So please uh, ask your nursery uh, to avoid using pesticides. 
How are butterflies doing these days? Well, you could probably guess, not all that great. More than 17% of North American butterfly species are in trouble. Uh, of course, our bees are in trouble as well, uh, but that's a, uh, that's a separate webinar. Can gardeners make a difference? I argue that yes, gardeners can make a difference. And I've got an example for you um, from Florida. Um, shown on the left is the Atala butterfly, a, a beautiful, uh, brilliantly colorful butterfly um, from South Florida. And to the right, believe it or not, are the caterpillars of that butterfly. They look like strawberry, strawberry jelly, jelly beans with bright yellow spots. Really, really crazy looking critters. Really wonderful. Uh, this butterfly was in grave danger of disappearing from Florida decades ago. Um, and then, uh, just by accident, I think, uh, not, not in an effort to save the butterfly, to my knowledge, lots of landscapers and gardeners started planting kunti, which is a cycad, a native cycad to Florida. And they started planting it uh, down in South Florida. Well, this happens to be the, a, a, a very wonderful host plant for the Florida Atala butterfly. So by bringing that host plant back to urban, to, uh, to you know, urban and suburban gardens in Miami and Fort Lauderdale, uh, they were able to bring this species back. Now here's an, a current, more current example, not a butterfly, uh, but a bumblebee, the rusty patch bumblebee, the first bee to be listed as an endangered species in the lower 48 states by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. This bee lives in rural areas, but it also lives in suburban and urban areas. And I've been told uh, that new populations are getting discovered in suburban and even urban gardens of Madison, Wisconsin and Minneapolis, Minnesota. Pretty amazing that uh, people's small gardens in, in, in town, in, in towns and cities are providing habitat for an endangered bee. So is it likely if you plant a butterfly garden that you're gonna help save a species from extinction? Probably not. Uh, that probably not likely that your garden will be uh, the single factor that saves a species, obviously. But will you likely help? Sure, absolutely. Um, and is it likely that you'll enjoy creating the habitat and enjoy the butterflies that are attracted due to the habitat you create? Uh, it's very likely that you will enjoy all that. So we've got a poll question. Um, Rachel, please help me with the poll question. I want to find out where folks are from. And if you have a hard time uh, determining where you are, just give it your best guess. Uh, I was born in Appalachia, so that would be uh, Western Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, much of Kentucky, Eastern Tennessee. Um, we've got some folks from Canada, that's phenomenal. And many, many folks from the Northeast, that's clearly uh, by far uh, the largest number. We've got uh, almost 80% of you have voted. Awesome. Thanks for voting, folks. Well, uh, lots of Northeasterners, which is not a big surprise, given that's uh, such a hub of, of uh, human population density. Um, uh, but it's, it's great for me to know that, that uh, actually might influence, uh, if I get to do future webinars on this topic, um, maybe I'll be allowed to do one for the Northeast. We'll see. OK. Uh, Let's see, can we minimize that? Or can we go on to the next poll, please? Maybe I should advance my slide. Oops. So uh, this one should be pretty self-explanatory. How much space do you have for gardening? I cannot believe how many of you 
have a half acre or more. Now, I don't mean you've got a half acre of lawn. That I, I mean that you're willing to actually plant a half acre of stuff. Um, but this is this is really uh, almost shocking to me. But it, it, it's it's great because the more land you have, the the more uh, habitat you can create for butterflies. Excellent. Um, for those of you who only have a balcony or a patio with potted plants, I will be mentioning at least one plant uh, uh, very explicitly that's a wonderful potted plant for a butterfly garden. I think a whole bunch of the plants I'm gonna talk about can be grown in pots. I know for a fact that, a whole, that numerous plants I will talk about can be uh, planted in pots. Uh, and I will be talking a little bit at the end about what to do if you have a half acre or more. So uh, thanks for those poll results. This is, this is uh, illuminating as well. And I'm gonna go on. Okay. So butterflies and their host plants. We've talked about that a little bit, how specific they are. I'm gonna talk about a few more, just a few. There are, uh, I should have had a poll on this perhaps. There are uh, 700 butterfly species in the US and it would be uh, interesting to know which host plants each one likes, but that would, that would take uh, 30 webinars. So we'll, we'll just go over a few. And my screen is frozen, looks like. Okay, uh, what species of caterpillar is this? Uh, I can't hear you and I, we don't have a poll set up for this, but typically when I show this slide, the majority of people say it's a monarch caterpillar. Uh, and it looks a lot like a monarch caterpillar, but it's not. It is a truly wonderful caterpillar and one that's very easy to get to your property, very easy to get if you only have a balcony. This is the caterpillar of the black swallowtail, butterfly, and the black swallowtail uses plants in the carrot family, including carrots. Uh, it lays its eggs on carrot, uh, but more, I think they like parsley, dill, fennel, and even cilantro more than they like carrot. And then there are numerous native plants. Now, what do I mean by native plants? Plants that have, uh, to our knowledge, uh, have been in the United States for hundreds of years and weren't brought over here um, by settlers from Europe, Asia, Africa, Australia. Um, and this talk will focus mostly on native plants. Uh, why a big focus on native plants? Uh, many reasons. Um, I'd say the main one is that when you're planting native plants, there are two main reasons. When you're planting native plants, there's much less likelihood that that plant is going to invade the environment. Uh, I wish I had a slide showing uh, kudzu, but many of you have heard of kudzu. It's a vine from, uh, I believe, Asia uh, that got planted in the southeast. And uh, I've seen it cover vast landscapes of the southeast. Uh, most of our native plants are not going to do that. Uh, the other reason to plant native plants is because more of our insect species uh, have adapted to using those native plants. So in general, they're going to be better for our insect populations. Okay, on to another species. Oh, I just want to mention uh, parsley, dill, fennel, cilantro, those are easy to grow in pots. If you put a pot of dill on your porch, uh, if you were near Central Park, uh, near some green area in Philadelphia or Chicago, there's a good chance you'd get eggs of the species on your dill or on your fennel. Uh, staying within the same butterfly family, uh, the swallowtails, uh, the pipe vine swallowtail, like the name suggests, only lays its eggs on pipe vine. So that leaf shown on the left is a pipe vine leaf. And uh, it's a small caterpillar on the left. Uh, on the right, he's gotten much bigger. And somebody, the photographer, uh, Brian Reynolds, uh, who's an amazing photographer, by the way, 
uh, here in Oklahoma. Brian probably poked the head of that caterpillar, causing him to extend his osmeteria. The osmeteria are those bright orange structures. What do those bright orange structures do? They squirt out smelly stuff to try to scare you away, to try to scare other predators away. Pretty, pretty cool stuff, uh, pretty fun. And this is uh, what that caterpillar will become, a resplendent pipevine swallowtail. Uh, another combination of host plant, caterpillar and butterfly, passion flower. Now I'm embarrassed not to show you the flower of the passion flower plant. It's an extremely exotic and exquisite looking flower. I say exotic, it looks like something from the tropics. It looks so beautiful and intricate, you can't believe it. But in fact, they are native to much of the Southern US. And uh, in the middle, that photo is the caterpillar, one of the caterpillars that eats passion flower. And that caterpillar, uh, if he's happy and healthy, will develop into a Gulf fritillary adult, which is more of a, more of a Southern species. Um, one year, I had 200 to 300 caterpillars of the species, and it was pretty, pretty fantastic. We have another butterfly family called the sulfurs. Uh, actually, the family uh, has butterflies called whites, uh, and it has sulfurs. The sulfur butterflies tend to be uh, yellow in color, and most of the sulfurs lay their eggs on various legumes. Legumes are plants uh, in the bean family. So on the left, right in the dead center of the photo is a sleepy orange caterpillar. Difficult to see because he's well camouflaged on the Senna marilandica plant that he's consuming. Um, I don't know of another common name for this plant other than Senna or wild Senna. That's, that's what we always called it. Uh, I'm sure it's got a common name. I apologize for not putting it. Uh, that caterpillar will eventually develop into the beautiful butterfly on the right sleepy orange. Um, I really love this photo. I love those blue dots on this caterpillar. This is the cloudless sulfur caterpillar feeding on partridge pea, which I know was abundant in Florida. It's abundant in Oklahoma. It was abundant in Nebraska and Iowa. So it's a widespread species. If you plant partridge pea on your land, there's a good chance, and you live in the south, there's a good chance, south of the Midwest, good chance you'll have cloudless sulfur caterpillars and the bright yellow butterflies on the right. Okay, um, my friend, my coworker, Sarah Hamilton Buxton up in North Dakota, uh, told me that I should include this species and she's right, it's the Dakota skipper. Um, most of you probably haven't got given much thought to skippers. Skippers are tiny little butterflies that are very, very flitty. Butterflies by nature are somewhat flitty, but these guys, uh, these guys take it to the extreme. They're very quick, very fast, tend to be very small, but some species are, are, are medium size. Um, and we actually have, I think between 70 and a hundred species of skippers in the eastern U.S., perhaps more than that. Oklahoma has dozens of species. The Dakota skipper is an endangered species. This lives, uh, a originally I think it was in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, probably uh, southern Canada as well. Um, there aren't many of them left. Um, what is the host plant of this butterfly? Amazingly, one of its main host plants is little blue stem, a grass. This happens to be one of the most abundant plants in North America. It's certainly one of the four most abundant grasses in the tall grass prairie. So why is this butterfly so rare when its host plant is so common? I don't think we fully understand that, uh, but I think uh, some of the habitat where it used to live has, has been destroyed. Uh, perhaps there are not enough flowers for it to feed on. It could be multiple factors. But uh, colleagues of mine and uh, many people up north are working to try to conserve the Dakota skipper. This is not a poll question. I just want you to think about it for a few seconds. How many species of milkweeds are in the United States? Sometimes I hear people talking um, about milkweed. Um, 
well, I'm sort of giving the answer away. They talk as if there's only one. Actually, there are over a hundred different species of milkweeds in the United States. It's one of the most diverse type of plants in America. And you could spend your whole lifetime trying to study them all. And it would be quite an enjoyable pursuit. This, uh, if you live up north, in New England or the Great Lakes states or the Midwest, when people talk milkweed, this is usually what they're talking about. When I was a kid in Western New York, this is the milkweed that was in our garden. Um, common milkweed, uh, big floppy leaves, really large flower clusters, large seed pods that open up to release uh, fluffy seed, uh, seeds with, with uh, fluffy structures to help them fly. I, I wish I had a picture of the seeds. Uh, here's a picture of a landscape with lots of common milkweed. This plant is indeed quite abundant in the North and Midwest. Uh, but please note, now this map, map is incomplete. Uh, the, the green, the counties shaded in green are counties where this plant has been documented. Uh, this has clearly got a lot of errors because every county in New York State and Iowa uh, has got this species at some time or another. I can pretty much guarantee that and, and many of the other counties. But the main idea is this is a plant of the Northeast and the North Central States, but not very important down South. So if you're a Southerner, uh, especially uh, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, uh, even Oklahoma, um, um, this species is, is really not a major part of the landscape. Uh, in fact, I have a friend, I uh, have to admit, uh, she's, and she's listening now, uh, 50 miles south of me, and she, she has a wonderful population of this plant. So it can grow in Oklahoma, maybe even in Texas, but, but uh, um, it's an important one. Now here's another really important one, swamp milkweed. Uh, monarchs love to lay their eggs on this plant, just like they love to lay eggs on common milkweed. This plant loves wet areas, but it does well in gardens too. Has a broad range. But like common milkweed, similar to common milkweed, this plant does not do that well in most of the deep south or the southern plains, uh, except for Florida for some reason, prob probably due to all the swamps and marshes down in Florida. But this plant is fairly easy to purchase. I find it very easy to grow. Monarchs love it. Uh, and the flowers are great for various pollinators. So I recommend this one. Uh, this happens to be my favorite, butterfly milkweed. Uh, this plant can be difficult to grow at first, but once you get it established, I it develops a very long taproot that might go a few feet down into the ground, and these can probably live for decades. The flowers are usually bright orange like this, but they can be bright yellow or almost red. Very importantly, if you're going to grow this one, they must have well-drained soil. The tubers, the tuberous roots rot if you plant it in poorly drained soils. Monarch butterflies do lay, do lay eggs on this species. Recent studies by a colleague of mine, Tori Posius, who got her PhD at Iowa State University, showed that in the laboratory setting and in the field setting, when given the choice, Monarchs didn't enjoy, didn't, were, were much less likely to lay eggs on the species when given a choice. But I worked in landscapes where this is the only milkweed, uh, or practically the only milkweed. And in my experience, in that scenario, they lay plenty of eggs on it. And the research of Tori Posius also showed that once the eggs hatch in the caterpillars, the caterpillars perform very well on the species. Um, so this is a good plant for monarchs, and it's the most widely distributed milkweed in the eastern half of the U.S. Uh, uh, it, it can be grown in North Dakota, uh, according, to, to my, according to my coworker Sarah, uh, and it's found naturally in just about every other state and even uh, parts of southern Canada. The reason why butterfly milkweed is so special, special to me is that it's extremely attractive to some hard to find butterflies, like the coral hair streak. You will almost never see a coral hair streak 
unless it's nectaring on butterfly milkweed. For some reason, it seems to be very specialized to nectar on this plant. Same thing goes with the banded hair streak. Same thing goes with the Edwards hair streak. I took this photo up in Iowa, and this is a somewhat rare butterfly, very exquisite little creature. And um, the only way I had of finding this butterfly was to go to butterfly milkweed plants and find it nectaring on it. There are numerous other butterflies and bees that love nectaring on this species. So I strongly recommend it, uh, recommend that you plant it in your garden if you have well-drained soils. In the South Central US, uh, the single most important plant for monarchs is green antelope corn milkweed. And this is blooming right now here in North Central Oklahoma. And this plant is really, really loaded with poisons called cardiac glycosides that make this plant highly toxic. It is so toxic that cattle almost never eat it. Therefore, it thrives in pastures and rangelands. The first three milkweed species I mentioned have much less amounts of these cardiac glycoside toxins. And sometimes those species get consumed by cattle. Uh, so if you're planting milkweed, if you're lucky enough to have a ranch and you want to plant some milkweeds out there, I know this doesn't apply to that many of you, but if you were to do that, this would be the species that would best tolerate grazing. And here's a pet species of mine that not enough people in the South know about. And it's called aquatic milkweed, Asclepius perennis. It's native range. Uh, you can see in the green, uh, the county is colored in green, uh, a little bit in the South Atlantic coast, Florida, the Gulf Coast, and on up, up in the Mississippi. As you can tell by the name, it likes wet areas. Uh, it really grows in swamps more than swamp milkweed does. And it'll grow in rivers. Uh, on the edges of rivers, and it can tolerate being underwater for weeks at a time. Uh, I find this plant beautiful. It's got beautiful clusters of white flowers. Uh, monarch caterpillars love this plant, even though it's extremely toxic. It has much higher levels of cardiac glycosides than any other milkweed I'll talk about today. Uh, the caterpillars don't seem to mind. They do fine. But one one reason why I'm talking so much about this plant, this plant grows wonderfully in pots. Um, it survives the winter in pots here in northern Oklahoma, even though we get down to, to uh, typically down to 10 degrees Fahrenheit or three degrees Fahrenheit on a cold winter night. So uh, really neat plant to grow in pots. Uh, you're not gonna find this plant and uh, at your typical store. So you're gonna have to hunt for this one, but hopefully this one will become more widely available. It's easy to grow from seed. So I encourage you to try to get the seed. And then finally, uh, to let you know that there are very different kinds of milkweeds. We have milkweed vines in the United States in a variety of genera, including honey vine milkweed. Um, most of these vines are down south and monarchs have been shown to like some of them, especially this one, honey vine milkweed. Now I wanna talk about nectar plants, particularly native nectar plants that occur across much of the country, thus are applicable to most of you. Milkweeds are amazing nectar plants, not just for, they're not just uh, food for monarch caterpillars, they're great food for monarch butterflies, regal fritillaries, which is the butterfly shown on the right, uh, and dozens of species of butterflies. So I strongly recommend every garden have milkweeds, even if you're not interested in monarch butterflies. This is maybe the most controversial uh, genus in the whole presentation, thistles, uh, in the genus Circium. Uh, what you see on the left uh, is tall thistle that I have allowed to come up in one of my gardens. It's six feet tall. Uh, that photo was taken last week. Uh, and I think it's probably gonna get to seven or eight feet tall. On the right is a monarch nectaring on tall thistle. That was on my property last year. Thistle, thistles are amazing for, for butterflies and bees, providing lots and lots of good nectar for them. Uh, here's the species I think more up north, field thistle. Uh, we at Xerces Society, 
are so high on native thistles that we developed a 92 page guide to native thistles of the United States and Canada. This PDF is free online. Just search Xerxes Thistle Guide if you wanna learn more about native thistles. This will actually tell you how to distinguish native thistles from the exotic ones. But let me tell you, these plants are, are beautiful, even though they're spiny, and if you touch one, it's gonna, it's gonna, gonna prick your skin. Uh, they're really great for pollinators. We as the Xerces Society, of course, do not promote invasive thistles like the musk thistle. Uh, this plant is native to Eurasia, Eurasia, and the bigger problem is that it spreads rampantly in crop fields. It is listed as a noxious weed in many states, including Oklahoma. Uh, I found some on my property last week. Uh, I'm going to eliminate it. Butterflies love it, but it's not worth having it around because it can take over our environment. Uh, the genus Eutrochium, uh, the Joe Pye weeds, uh, is a wonderful group of wonderful genus of nectar plants. Uh, my colleagues in the upper Midwest and the Northeast in particular recommended these. Um, coneflowers in the genus Echinacea. Uh, this one shown here, purple coneflower, is very readily available. Uh, plenty of discount stores and big box stores sell this one. Uh, this is one of the easiest native plants to find. Often they're selling cultivars. Uh, that might not be as good as the, the, the native plants from the wild, but let's not worry about that too much today. Uh, I'm, re I'm a big fan of the coneflowers in the genus Echinacea. Um, this purple coneflower does best in the eastern half of the country with a fair amount of moisture. Um, here in prairie country, uh, Iowa, Missouri, eastern Oklahoma, this can be the most abundant cone flower, uh, and it's pretty, pretty fantastic. And then as we get into the Great Plains states, North Dakota, Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, on down to, to Texas, I presume, uh, narrow leaf cone flower becomes the most abundant echinacea species. And if you've ever bought echinacea uh, at the pharmacy to help fight a cold, this is the species it's harvested from. Of course, we'd rather you keep the plants out in the wild and not harvest them, but just thought you'd like to know, this is the echinacea that's so important for medicine. Uh, no butterfly garden should be without sunflowers. There are many wonderful species of sunflowers, including annual sunflower, which is the one that produces, produces the seeds that we eat. Uh, swamp sunflower, shown on the right and a very easy one to grow uh, in the central U.S. Maximilian sunflower. Uh, woodland sunflower is more of a northeastern species. Uh, another great genus are the blazing stars. They tend to have uh, uh, tall cylindrical spikes of uh, clusters of small purple flowers. Um, beautiful. This is a, a photo I took of a prairie in northern Missouri, and uh, it, it makes me sad I haven't been there in two years. Golden rods are phenomenal for butterflies. Many people falsely associate golden rods with allergies, fall allergies. Uh, while the fragrance of a golden rod can come out, can cause allergies in some, uh, those with fall allergies are more likely allergic to ragweeds and other uh, less conspicuous plants that happen to be blooming at the same time. We can't forget about the asters, uh, tend to have clusters of purple flowers. The verbenas, uh, such as these here. Okay, now I wanna talk about some regional favorites and I'm gonna to need to speed up. And I know I've been going fast already, my apologies. On the Atlantic coast, uh, my coworkers, uh, including Kelly Gale in New Jersey, uh, suggested seaside goldenrod would be a wonderful species to be growing in coastal areas. If you're living on the Jersey Shore or Maryland or Massachusetts, uh, even down on the Florida coast. 
And coastal Joe pieweed uh, was found to be the number one nectar plant in a study conducted in central Pennsylvania by Connie Schmotzer of Penn State University and the master gardeners of central Pennsylvania. So coastal Joe pieweed, I mentioned this genus before, this species apparently is really, really attractive to butterflies. Uh, and they conducted a really nice study in which they had uh, over 40 species planted together and they were able to compare them. In the northeastern US, uh, you might try to find New York aster, which is uh, only found in uh, the northeast. In the north central states, uh, Rocky Mountain Blazing Star, Leatris ligula stylus, uh, has been referred to as crack cocaine for monarch butterflies. The nectar of it is so uh, enticing to monarchs that you can walk right up to them and grab them off the flowers. Leatris ligula stylus. In the southern U.S., I'm a huge fan of the genus Ver Verbicina. Um, and Ver Verbicina virginica is a very amazing plant. It's called frostweed because it forms giant crystals of ice uh, on frosty mornings in winter. Uh, this is an extremely important plant for monarchs in central Texas each fall as they migrate to Mexico. In the southeast, many species I could talk about. I'm going to talk about Carpheferus or chaff seed. This picture doesn't do it, do it justice. Uh, tall panicles of beautiful purple flowers that butterflies love. Uh, and they might attract a butterfly like the zebra longwing. In the Southern Plains where I live, Engelman's daisy can be pretty great. Greg's blue mist is a must have for butterfly gardeners in Texas. And I'll say probably a must have for those, those of us in Oklahoma as well. This is in my garden last fall and it was really, really enticing to butterflies. Uh, this is my single favorite native annual in the U.S., Verbicina and Celioides. Uh, this flower is both beautiful and attracts virtually every insect pollinator I know. Uh, butterflies, bumblebees, monarchs. Um, this is a picture I took this week showing this species lining the path to my compost pile. I don't even have to plant them. They just self-sow them seed, self-sow their seeds. And I've never had to pay a cent for this plant because Sandy Schwinn, an amazing gardener in Tulsa, gave me the seeds years ago. And um, uh, they just keep on uh, self-sowing. Exotic plants for nectar? Well, there are dozens I could talk about, but I'm not as big of a fan of planting exotic plants. Uh, zinnias are, are really, really fantastic. But why plant, why spend a lot of time on exotic plants uh, when the native plants are more likely to serve as host plants for butterflies um, and when our native plants are less likely to invade our natural ecosystems? Now, another exotic plant I'll tell you about, chives, are easy to plant in your herb garden and they end up being very good for butterflies. And please consider adding flowers to your lawn, whether they're native flowers or exotic flowers, like white clover. The state of Minnesota recently started a program where by their helping people plant pollinator habitat in their lawns. Farm scale butterfly habitat restoration. We own 10 acres. It used to be prairie. Much of it has been invaded by these trees. So, uh, and, and under those, these trees were no wildflowers and no butterflies. So I got a chainsaw and I actually got assistance uh, from the US Fish and Wildlife Service to get rid of these cedar trees. And I know a lot of people love forests and I love forests. And I still have, we still have oak forest on our land, but we got rid of a lot of the trees and I planted wildfires uh, and now we have lots of monarch habitat where we used to have um, invasive trees. So it's been very rapidly successful. Beautiful flowers growing there that are very appealing to monarchs and other pollinators. Where can you get more information about butterflies and butterfly gardening? 
Uh, the Xerxes Society produces a lot of books. Uh, obviously most relevant to us in this conversation is Gardening for Butterflies. We have many, many free brochures and guidebooks. Uh, you can get the download them free online. You can go to our YouTube channel. Uh, this webinar will be rebroadcast, uh, will, will be placed on our YouTube channel. And I just took a look at the YouTube channel today and you can see there are multiple webinars and other videos on our YouTube channel. Or you can connect to us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Xerces Society. The monarch plant lists are pretty fantastic, uh, and as are the pollinator plant lists. Uh, um, they're a four page PDF. Uh, you're seeing just the front page of each one and we have them for every region of the lower 48. And inside each four page document is, a, is basically the top 25, a list of the top 25 plants for monarchs or the list of the top 25 plants for pollinators in general. And this is a free download at the Xerces website. Oh, this is what the interior looks like. I forgot that I had a slide. So you see that's in this case, 24 species, and we have some information on each one. We also have, if you wanna learn how to identify milkweeds in your area, we working together with Monarch Joint Venture have produced fact sheets on milkweeds. Now we call it roadside milkweeds, but in fact, all of the, most of these milkweeds will grow on other habitats and not just roadsides. And we have these for every region of the lower 48. They're, uh, they're uh, obviously a free download. And then these are the NRCS guides that I did mention uh, in response to one of the questions. And uh, I helped to develop um, three or four of them. And um, these give very long lists of, inf uh, of butterflies, of uh, plants that are good for monarch butterflies. And it has two pages of information on each species. So this is a free download at NRCS Monarchs. I ask you to please create habitat for butterflies and other pollinators wherever you can whether it's in your lawn or in a garden, next to a compost pile, along a pond, along your driveway. We know how to do it. The Xerces Society can, and other organizations can continue to help you provide, provide the information of what to plant, how to plant it. We just need to go out and do it. It will make a difference. I wanna thank Connie Schmotzer for uh, sending me her data. I want to thank Rachel, our host of the webinar today. I want to thank Liz Robertson, a Xerces Society employee, for helping me create some of these slides. I want to thank Brian Reynolds, Brian E. Reynolds, who took many of the photos that you saw today. And I want to thank Sandy Schwinn for donating those seeds and donating so much information and advice to me over the years. Uh, the Xerces Society has to thank our, our partners. Um, we are supported by a, a large and diverse family of over 12,000 members in 15, over 15 countries. We get funding from numerous private foundations. Uh, we get assistance from uh, technical assistance from numerous scientists. Uh, dozens of federal, state, and local agencies work with us. Hundreds of farmers and land managers have allowed us to work with them to create habitat on their land. Numerous companies support us. And of course, the thousands of people who protect invertebrates in their neighborhoods, uh, they are part of the Xerces family. Uh, I ask that you consider uh, becoming a member of the Xerces Society. Uh, donors make our work possible. We are a nonprofit supported by uh, uh, grants in some cases, but also uh, largely by donations. So please consider becoming a member today at xerces.org slash donate. And I believe that is the end of my presentation. All right, thank you, Ray. We have um, quite a few really good questions. We're gonna try to get through 
Um, all of them we may not today, but um, some of them are repetitive. So one of the questions that have popped up multiple times is about plant lists. And um, we went through it pretty quickly, but if you go to our website, we have a resource center. And if you just put in the state you live in, or even um, the territory, if you're in Canada, um, it will give you those lists and other resources. So definitely check out our website. We have um, all of those resources are free in our books. You can also find on our website or on Amazon or Powell's as well. So the first question, someone, a couple people also asked about cultivars of native plants, if those are as good for butterflies or not as good. And this person was specifically asking about um, yarrow cultivars from a nursery versus the native variety obtained from yeah. a nursery in Canada. That's a wonderful question. Um, I have no personal experience with research on the issue, but I believe we, I have colleagues, we have colleagues in Xerces who do have some experience with that. Um, some of the cultivars end up being just as good as the native, uh, uh, the, the native uh, genotypes, but uh, some of the cultivars are not. So some research shows that some cultivars through, through the process of being bred for large flower size, really bright colors, things like that, uh, they, they lose, uh, they may have diminished nectar quantity or quality. So uh, as far as Yero, I certainly can uh, answer the specifics of that. I apologize. This is a good question. So um, this woman has a young choke cherry in her yard and she thinks that tiger swallowtails do use them for laying eggs. But she asks um, if you could talk a little bit about how often to look for eggs, when, and what the risks are to the eggs outside. And for context, she lives in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, uh, tiger swallowtails. Um, uh, my daughter saw one today. So, so um, yeah, they. Now here, this is Oklahoma, but I, I'm I'm sure they're out in Wisconsin as well. The, we typically. Uh, Tiger swallowtails, I believe, have multiple generations per year. And so the first generation comes out in early spring and a second generation comes out in, uh, in late spring and then probably uh, additional generations in mid and, and late summer. So this would be a good time to look for eggs, I imagine, uh, depending where you are. Uh, and sure, there's a lot of risk to those eggs, um, uh, not from you looking at them, but from uh, predators and parasites, absolutely. There are, there are all kinds of predators, parasitoids, parasites that could hurt uh, butterfly caterpillars and, lar and, and eggs, caterpillars and pupae. Um, but we, we typically uh, recommend folks leave them be. Um, but uh, if you wanna bring a few inside, um, um, you can do that. We actually have some protocols uh, some some recommendations on how to do that so that it's better for the butterfly. So this question is interesting. I never even um, thought about it, but someone asked if citronella candles or oil harm butterflies. Once again, <clears throat> you, you, you got a blank for me. <laughs> Stump the expert today. <laughs> no, it's an I don't know if there's ever been a study on that. I think that's a very interesting thought. I'd never thought about that before. I, uh, yes, I, uh, yeah, I, I would think that it would be, would be somewhat bothersome, yet um, we, we've almost never used them. So I don't, I don't have personal experience and that I've seen no research on it. So one person asked, why are some butterflies specialized on nectar? What it is, what is it that they are after? That, is a, a, a wonderful question that I think is completely wide open. I, I think there's been very little research on that topic. Um, because there, there are some butterflies that are really not that choosy at all. Um, now, now I, I'm not saying they'll go to every single different kind of flower. Um, there are certain flowers that are shaped better to have a morphology uh, that are better suited for bees. Uh, and some are better for butterflies in general. Um, but why some, like the coral hair streak and various other hair streaks, um, would go so often to that butterfly milkweed, I do not know. And it would be, uh, 
one, one thing is, is that these butterflies tend to only be out for a few weeks each year. And they tend to be out when that plant is blooming. So do they like that plant so much because that's when the butterfly comes out? Um, or does the butterfly come out because that, that's when the plant is there? That's a quite, that's very uh, distinctly a possibility. Uh, some have speculated that the, the Dakota skipper, the endangered butterfly in North Dakota, uh, they've speculated that it emerges so that it comes out right when narrow leaf uh, purple coneflower is blooming because it really likes the nectar of that plant. Awesome. This next question, someone is asking about species for farm scale, since a lot of folks on the webinar have more than 10 acres available. Are there any specific resources that you could recommend to them? Well, uh, um, yes. Uh, now I feel like a fool for, for rushing by a few, few slides toward the end. Um, uh, yes, uh, search, do a Google search for NRCS monarchs. And if you Google, if you do a search, a web search for NRCS monarchs, it takes you to a page and at the bottom of the page are links to important plant guides for monarchs. Even if you're interested in other butterflies and not monarchs, these important plant guides for monarchs give long uh, lists of butterflies for various regions of the country. We have these for the Northern Plains, Southern Plains, Midwest, uh, Gulf Coast and the Appalachians. Um, and I worked on some of those with the NRCS. So search NRCS monarchs. Um, but the Xerces Society nectar plant fact sheets, which I also skimmed by, um, those give recommendations for plants that will do great on large acreages. All the plants I talked to, I, I, I think all the plants I talked about, all the native plants I talked about today would do well on large acreages. Okay, um, so we will end on this last question. I think it's interesting. So um, this person asked about birds that they eat quite a few caterpillars and is that a problem? And that they've heard statistics that birds eat 95% of the monarch butterflies. I don't know if you know if that's true or not or if you have any comments about birds eating caterpillars, if there's any competition there. Sure. Um, caterpillars in general, um, uh, yes, birds eat moth caterpillars in great abundance, and I'm sure there are various butterfly caterpillars uh, that they will eat. Um, I have, don't have much experience with birds eating monarch caterpillars. I have more experience with spiders eating monarchs and ants and other things like that. Um, as far as birds killing 95% of monarchs, that is, um, that's, that, that's, that's not true anywhere, I don't think. Um, it seems very likely uh, of 90% of monarch eggs do not make it to maturity. It might even be 99% of eggs laid aren't going to make it to adulthood uh, because the eggs or caterpillars or pupae get eaten or parasitized or uh, but, um, but it's not birds doing 95% of that. Um, in Mexico, um, where the monarchs, many of the monarchs go in winter, um, there are birds that have learned to eat monarchs and they do eat in some years millions of them, but I don't think they've ever uh, gotten rid of more than half of the monarch population, Prob probably a good deal less than half. But thank you so much for joining us today. Check out our YouTube channel. And thank you so much, Ray. That was a wonderful presentation. And we appreciate your time and hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you, Rachel, for the opportunity. And thank you everybody for attending. Bye-bye.